Welcome everybody to the Aspect Research Centre for Autism Practice or RCAP webinar series. Today we'll look at Aspect's Research Priorities Project and the new research agenda. I'm Tom Tutton, Executive Manager at Aspect Practice. First up, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today. We pay respect to their elders, past and present, and we're acknowledging the continual connections First Peoples have with their culture and country, and we welcome any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people joining us here today. Okay, just a quick introduction into Aspects Research Priorities Project. Um, today's webinar, I think, is really exciting, and it marks a new beginning for research at Aspect. Up to this point, Aspects Research, I think, has been very helpful, but the way it's been organised and delivered has been a little ad hoc. Um, in its direction. The Research Priorities Project changes all of this. Well, at least the ad hoc bit, hopefully the helpful bit will still remain. Um, today, we have a team of presenters from RCAP who will share information about the background to the project, the methods, the findings of the Research Priorities Project. Importantly, I think for me, this is a really solid commitment to aspect for one, co-production. So working with autistic people to design conduct and disseminate research, and two, ensuring that research meets the assessed needs of autistic people. And hopefully, as a practitioner, um, that this results in exciting, new and effective services for ASPECT. I just wanted to note that this approach wouldn't have been possible without the guidance, support and lived ex experience and expertise of um, a lot of autistic people who've been involved I um, wanted just to say thank you to them and as well to the broader autism community, including parents and carers and a whole range of practitioners. Our agenda today, um, we begin with a presentation around partnerships and co-production by Ainsley. Um, and then uh, Trevor and Mustafa will talk a little bit about the Research Priorities Project and what comes from that in terms of the next research agenda. And then we'll have three short lightning talks by Rue, Chris and Vicky on the different topics that you can see there. All of that probably should take just over 40 minutes, which hopefully will give us at least 10 minutes for a really interesting Q&A. So just to begin with, I'm going to do a quick who's who in the RCAP zoo before we start. Uh, Ainsley, my colleague here, recently moved from Aspect's research team into the role of working in partnership officer at Aspect. A working in partnership role aims to embed partnership with autistic people in Aspect's research, governance, HR, service planning, and service delivery. Ainsley supported the development of Aspect's working in partnership charter, which, if you're interested, is available on Aspect's website. Next up, we have Trevor. Trevor's my boss, so I have to be especially kind here. Uh, Trevor is a researcher with a comprehensive um, an, uh, experience and knowledge of educational programs, service provision, and research in the field of autism. Um, I will skip over how many years Trevor's been involved in that and perhaps just get on to recommending Trevor's book, which is called Exploring Giftedness, which is published by R Routledge. And, and this information about uh, twice exceptional students has helped aspects certainly assess and support um, gifted students. And uh, next up is Mustafa. Mustafa is a public health researcher who's completed his PhD at the University of Sydney. He's also an investigator on an international health project looking at health and health services and is my most excellent research partner at RCAP as well. So welcome Mustafa. And then last up for the lightning talks, we have Rue. Rue completed her PhD at La Trobe University, examining emotional regulation and mental health. And Rue has also conducted research in autism on the topics of tertiary education, employment, and financial well being. Uh, and then we have Chris, who is also helping to host the webinar today. Chris completed his uh, PhD investigating how teleconsultation as part of professional development programs could support rural and remote educators and to promote inclusive practices. And last up, we have Vicky. Vicky manages all things RCAP and has co-authored a number of papers into autism assessment practices, as well as um, an important area and Vicky's special interest area, 
around the intersection between autism and the criminal justice system, including the development of training modules for police, which is currently being rolled out in different states and territories. So now we will begin today's presentations. Hi, all, and thanks for having me here to talk about partnership today or working in partnership with autistic people. So at first, I just wanted to talk a little bit about why working in partnerships important. As I've got here, when we all work together and bring together the perspectives of all stakeholders, including professionals, families, carers, community diverse groups, and autistic people, we can create services and supports that are the most respectful, better quality and universally acceptable and appropriate. It's important to include autistic people in um, research, particularly research to practice research, because obviously that research is going to be informing different supports and services, particularly an aspect where we have our own centre dedicated to sort of that improvement of our evidence-based practices. So it's important because it's just the right thing to do. Communities should have autonomy over the services and supports that, um, that you know, are, are supporting our communities. And particularly when you've got research to practice, it's that research that's informing those practices. So it's the right thing to do to make sure that the community who were the end user um, agree with those supports. Also, um, different thinkers with different priorities and different ways of seeing things. So I think this is particularly relevant in autism, but uh, similarly across all disabilities, oftentimes the disability community doesn't see their disability the same way that um, service providers and parents do. Um, this is particularly true in autism. So including all of those perspectives is really important in order to ensure that your research and then in service is really relevant and a good fit with um, everyone who's going to be using that, particularly the autistic person themselves. And um, this idea of different thinking and different sort of ways of perceiving the world and talking about setting priorities, this is particularly relevant to this webinar because this is about research, um, priority setting, understanding. So nobody understands autism and what it actually feels like better than autistic people. So doing research without that lens is disingenuous. And because of that understanding that autistic people can add to the research, it uh, just creates better outputs because you've got that sort of really authentic lens. So moving along, what is partnership? And when looking at partnership, there's really a ladder of participation as to how much sort of partnership a community has. Um, and we'll talk specifically about sort of partnership and research for this. So as you move up the partnership ladder, it really sort of describes how much autonomy or like genuine partnership a community has um, when doing the research. So down the bottom, we've got very much um, doing two. So down the bottom here, underneath educating, you've got how I guess um, autism was seen decades ago. So you've got professionals saying they know what's best and doing things to autistic people. In the, in the middle sort of section is doing for. And that's kind of, I think, where, we, where we've gotten up to probably in the last decade, which is we're starting to engage with, consult with, sometimes it's still a little bit informing the autistic community. So little bits of input here and there. But as you climb up the level of participation, you move towards sort of real authentic shared um, decision and power, um, decision making and power sharing, which is doing with. So that's in a research context, 
uh, researchers, researchers sort of sharing the whole research process together, coming up with ideas for research pro projects together, um, creating research questions together, designing the process together, going through and uh, doing data collection together, writing the literature review. It's the whole um, research process from woe to go, from right from idea and design through to dissemination. And that way, when you're capturing um, community or autistic perspective right at that very beginning, you know that you're not going to be coming back right at the end stage where if you were just consulting or engaging autistic people sort of near the end and they go, oh, I, this doesn't feel quite right, you eliminate that because you've had that input the whole way through the process. So how do we do this? So as I just mentioned, partnership really is from the very first idea of a research project all the way through to dissemination. There should be points throughout that process where um, you've got research partners, autistic research partners engaged. Um, so you're not getting a little bit further along in the process and it, it's just not, um, it's not authentic partnership. So that's the really, really important part of it. And some of the ways, but not all the ways we do that at RCAP are advisory groups, working groups, research, autistic researchers and research assistants, as well as autistic consultants. For the research priorities project, we did have a research priorities advisory group. And because we were trying to find the research priorities of not only just autistic people, but like fa families, parents and carers as well. We had a very diverse group of um, autistic adults, parents of autistic children, practitioners and autism researchers. And there's a, some people uh, in this project were also wearing jewel hats as well. So Many thanks to the members of this advisory group, Dr. Trevor Clark, Louise Cummins, Belinda Duncombe, Karen Huss, Dr. Mel Hayworth, Dr. Genevieve Johnson, Matt Osler, Professor Liz Pelicano, Krishna Sadhana, and Yogi Wirestra. Through They were involved right from the very design and um, and saw the project through in its entirety. In this project, we also had uh, autistic researchers and we had parents of autistic children who are also researchers doing all of the interviews for this project. So I think because this project was really quite uh, we were asking for a lot of personal details for our autistic participants. I think it really helped to have the authenticity of having an autistic person to speak to in this process. And I think that same level of comfortability was built with the parents that we interviewed because there was that sort of shared understanding of experience. And I think it really led to participants feeling more comfortable with the process because there was that understanding of the um, perspective. And the last slide from me is RCAP's research to practice partnership approach. So this is our, um, our cycle of obviously research to practice partnership. So what happens is we have when we're research um, priorities setting, there'll be an ongoing consultation with a diverse range of people. Um, this is practitioners, people in the autism and autistic communities, and this is to identify areas of need of research. And this is very much where this project fits in. It's trying to find those initial things that are really, really important to people. And then following this, um, the researchers at RCAP will explore gaps in the current literature to try and develop the research agenda. Uh, then these 
these gaps or these areas are prioritised once again with people in the autistic and autism communities, practitioners and researchers. The, then it moves on to the design and implementation stage. So that's like the bulk of the research. That's all done in co-production with autistic staff and researchers. And also that's where things like advisory groups and consultants come in as well. And the, these research um, findings are then translated, outcomes are reported, and um, hopefully then they make their way into, and you can see down the bottom, aspects comprehensive approach. And this is um, basically like the giant manual with um, all of our best evidence informed practices that our education and therapy staff or any of our practitioners use an aspect. And then that cycle goes on and, and continues. So that's all from me. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Ainsley, uh, for sharing your uh, perspective on partnering with autistic people, families and carers in research. Uh, we're now going to outline for you the results of the research priorities study and importantly, the outcomes of the um, project that is the new uh, research agenda and new studies for RCAP. The purpose and aims, just briefly, of this study was um, they were very important to aspect and really to all, they should be to all researchers in the field of autism, is to align our research, our studies and our research agenda to the priorities of autistic people, their parents and carers. And in our organisation, um, the research as well as our services, the, our aim is that uh, the people that come to our services realise their goals and aspirations through the provision of appropriate services, programmes and resources. And of course, that's all underpinned by research, which should reflect the priorities of autistic people in the first place. So in the Research Priorities Project, we sought to understand what does a good life mean for autistic people and um, their parents and carers, and also what might help or hinder autistic people, parents and carers, in achieving a good life. So they were very open-ended uh, questions uh, that was done purposely to understand, you know, what are the priorities arising from you know, their challenges and their experiences in seeking a, a good life. So the reason, which goes back to our aims, was to develop a research agenda. Um, and so this, um, the three um, parts of the whole process that was undertaken was the actual study and it was broken into two phases and then we're also reporting on the outcome. So it's really an example of translation of research to practice. In this case the practice is the new research agenda that um, is informed by the priorities of autistic people and also their parents and carers. Just in phase one um, it was uh, national interviews across Australia with um, autistic people. There were 34 autistic people that were interviewed, 14 autistic adolescents, and 31 parents and carers of autistic people of all age. And the aim was to understand, you know, what a good life means for autistic people and, you know, what might help or hinder. Phase two of the um, project was we kind of turned the outcomes, the key themes that people um, reported in the interviews in phase one, we translated them into a survey in terms of um, for aspects, for autistic participants, parents and carers, and also staff. So we undertook a survey that reflected 
the key themes from the phase one of the project. Um, and to, to, it was a ranking exercise as to see, in their view, what were the priorities of those key themes identified. So there were 93 participants responded to the survey, and it was a mixture of autistic people. And this is just a reminder who accessed aspect services. It wasn't to the wider autism community. And again, to the parents of autistic people, whether school-aged children, um, very young children undergoing aspect therapy, or um, adults. Participants were asked to, as I said, to categorise each theme according to the degree of importance and the research agenda. Um, as a result, which we've just uh, working on finalising at the moment. So now I'm going to hand to Mustafa, who will um, overview each of the priorities of autistic people that resulted out of the two phases of the project. Thank you, Trevor, um, for the introduction. And um, just going off what Trevor uh, explained um, in terms of um, the two phases of the study, um, the results were down to eight uh, priority areas, which were identified um, through mainly the first study and as well um, as the second study showing the, the importance of pretty much every uh, or almost every area that we, we asked about. The first priority area we identified was establishing and maintaining relationships. And um, people usually said that uh, relationships were kind of sources of companionship and uh, practical day-to-day -to -day support. And they kind of formed a bridge between um, the autistic person's world and the neurotypical world. And this kind of um, was reinforced with people um, talking about, um, especially when they talked about their um, intimate uh, partners uh, or intimate relationships, but also in, um, in the sense of uh, platonic uh, relations as well. Um, however, we uh, noted the challenge of social differences resulting in misunderstanding. Um, and um, a lot of people kind of gave us um, information about them not being understood correctly by others that they're communicating with. So, and especially not understanding the social intents of, of other people. Um, and of course, research into this area uh, may help to better understand enablers and barriers to establishing or maintaining social relationships and how they can be mitigated. Uh, and of course, to promote increased understanding of autism um, so that um, more meaningful social connections can, can be established. Uh, the second area, which kind of was possibly the most important in terms of people um, speaking about it was the area of mental health or taking care of mental health. The majority of our participants actually said um, that they have been clinically diagnosed with anxiety or depression, um, and they've um, been experiencing long-term difficulties. Um, uh, and they associated these with normally like bullying, negative social experiences, unpredictability, um, and also feeling of uh, low self-worth and needing to mask or, you know, to, to pretend to be normal. Um, and the lack of uh, appropriate mental health uh, services were also um, identified. And um, we can see that's a goal for a lot of people uh, from uh, the interviews um, was to actually um, overcome anxiety and overcome uh, mental health for them to actually live a better life. So uh, that was, I think, one of the key factors. The third area is uh, self-acceptance and acceptance in the, in the community. Um, and many experience lack of acceptance and social inclusion in their daily lives, um, whether that's at the workplace, at schools, in social settings, 
Um, and of course, there was a social stigma and lack of understanding of autism in the community. So people um, also had issues with disclosing, uh, whether that's to workplaces or um, in their social life. Um, and of course, the stigma around uh, that. And also the self-acceptance and a positive um, uh, autistic identity enhanced their quality of life. So that's what uh, some people um informed us. So that's why self-acceptance, um, working towards self-acceptance and positive autistic identity is uh, quite important. And um, also we were informed that autistic diagnosis led to greater self-acceptance, uh, especially by people that were diagnosed um, at uh, you know, a, a later age. Um, and you know, we can see this, you know, it's brilliant knowing that I'm autistic. That's part of really um, uh, that part is really good about my life. And research in this area may enhance community understanding of autism and build more inclusive and supportive workplaces, schools, and um, communities. So um, the other area of, um, of uh, uh, research priority, which uh, it has been separated to a later um, area that we'll talk about, and that's uh, transitioning to adult life, is, is the workplace. And thriving in the workplace has been kind of made into a separate um, priority area because it was kind of constant by everyone. Um, you know, whether it's parents or children talking about their future or, or adults uh, speaking about um, uh, their... Um, uh, their uh, efforts to find uh, a job that's uh, a good fit and that works to their strengths. So I think um, uh, it's an important step in transition towards uh, independent adult life. Um, and also it's uh, important in, um, as it's important to view uh, the workplace as a strength-based, uh, in a strength-based uh, approach. Um, and of course, workplaces need to be uh, more inclusive uh, environments with tailored and inclusive training and induction. Um, so again, there were, of course, um, challenges. Uh, for example, uh, a 35-year-old uh, autistic man said they want me out because they don't understand me. And normally, they kind of surrounded that lack of understanding of autism by employers. So research in this area may identify how workplaces and employers can be more inclusive and provide appropriate support and culture um, to accommodate autistic people, um, and as well as um, to provide uh, um, kind of more inclusive, um, uh, uh, you know, interviewing processes and um, processes uh, for job applications as well. So um, the other area was enhancing educational experiences and um, uh, this priority area aimed at enhancing the educational options and experiences of autistic children and their families. So, um, School is always going to be an, uh, an ongoing challenge, as uh, this mother of a seven-year-old uh, autistic child informed us, um, and that, you know, different people and different teachers um, impact a lot how the individual uh, child is, uh, is progressing, especially in main school uh, settings. Um, so in mainstream school settings. So um, I think that's also important uh, to enhance um, training um, and uh, professional development uh, for teachers to work with um, autistic children. Um, um, and we also um, noticed a lack of implementation of autism informed teaching practices, accommodation and support in mainstream schools. Um, and of course, um, the importance um, of autism specific schools uh, in this space. Um, and um, as, as I mentioned, our research could uh, prioritize teacher training and how teachers can be more inclusive of, um, uh, of uh, autistic students in mainstream environments. Um, and how to achieve best possible educational um, outcomes. So um, the other priority was accessing autism specific support services. Um, and a lot of people um, 
mentioned uh, some barriers to accessing uh, support services that are either autism specific or autism friendly or inclusive. Um, and part of that is, of course, geographical location. So these settings are less common in uh, regional or rural areas. But then there are um, other barriers in terms of training uh, of those that are providing uh, therapy or providing those services. So um, parents prioritized access to respite as well and to therapy services at enhancing their children's uh, skill developments. Um, and of course, better access to practical help with managing everyday life, access to medical services and psychological uh, supports were identified as particularly important. Um, in terms of research, um, it may inform how further professional development and training may create more inclusive support services and how um, to increase accessibility of, aut uh, of autism specific support services. Um, speaking of workplaces earlier, transition to adult life is actually looking at um, kind of the outlook to the future for both the parents of uh, young autistic people or um, autistic adolescents, as well as people um, uh, actually in their adult stage speaking about their challenges and uh, uh, barriers and enablers they faced. So I think um, one of the key factors was transition to adult life, independent living and the outlook uh, for the future, and particularly uh, parents uh, were concerned with their child's life after they pass away. And this was kind of repeated by uh, a number of, uh, of parents um, and that they're unsure how the future is going to, um, to kind of um, uh, evolve. And the same kind of concern was given to us by younger autistic people is um, kind of a fear of, um, uh, of what's what's coming ahead. Uh, so concerns um, about limited supports available for adult life, financial security, living arrangements, and career opportunities were all um, factors that were shared to us uh, that may impact quality of life going into the future. So research may inform what support may assist in transition to adulthood and how autistic people may be supported at different stages um, in the life cycle. Um, and that's important for both autistic people and those that um, care for them and their, and their parents. The last priority area was managing self-care and experiences of burnout. And um, a key area of that is actually not so much support with what people can't do, but support to help them do more. Um, and we can see, for example, um, this 46-year-old uh, autistic woman telling us, I've always been the kind of person who's done everything. I'll just do everything. I can do everything, but I acknowledge that I can't do that anymore and work. So um, the importance of kind of um, helping people um, with their day-to-day -day activities, as well as um, pursuing a career or um, uh, other commitments at the same time. Uh, and of course, the need to recharge and maintain a sense of balance was fundamental to maintaining quality of life um, and to avoid exhaustion and autistic burnouts. So research in this area may um, inform how to best support autistic people to manage daily living with other commitments such as work and how to best avoid increased pressure, exhaustion and autistic burnout. Um, I'll pass back to um, Trevor again um, to introduce the research agenda which resulted from um, these priority areas. Thank you. Thank you Mustafa for um outlining the eight uh, priorities from the Research Priorities Project. Um, as I mentioned at the start of this presentation, the translation of the outcomes of this project um, are going immediately into the RCAP research agenda. So for the final part of the webinar, we will have three lightning talks from three of the RCAP researchers who will 
outline um, three priorities, projects um, going forward that will commence in 2023. So thank you. One of the programs we're currently working on that is aligned with the research priority of improving the mental health of autistic people is the self-compassion program of research. Self-compassion involves treating yourself in a kind and gentle manner. Being kind towards ourselves is even more important when we have made a mistake, failed at something, or when we're going through a tough situation in life. The three main elements of self-compassion are mindfulness, self-kindness, and common humanity. These are opposites of over-identification, self-criticism, and isolation. Last year, we conducted the first ever empirical study looking at the self-compassion experiences of autistic adults. The findings have been recently published as a journal article um, with the Journal of Autism and Developmental Disorders. For this study, we surveyed both autistic and non-autistic adults, and we also interviewed autistic adults. If you would like a copy of our paper to read, please feel free to contact us. Our email address is on the final slide. One of the key findings from the survey was that as a group, the autistic adults who participated in our study um, reported lower levels of self-compassion than the non-autistic adults. In addition, the autistic participants who had higher levels of self-compassion were younger in age, had lower anxiety and depression symptoms, and had higher levels of well-being. These findings suggest that there is a strong relationship between self-compassion and mental health in autistic adults. Through the interviews with autistic adults, we found that most of our participants saw the importance of being self-compassionate, but found it difficult to be. Many also reported that the ability to be self-compassionate can build over time through practice. One participant who practiced self-compassion over the last few years commented that self-compassion changed her life. So in our study last year, we found a strong relationship between autistic adults and self-compassion levels and mental health. This year, we want to focus on developing an online self-compassion program to find out if it would improve people's mental health. We are co-producing this online self-compassion program that is currently under development. Anna, Aya and Chris are on our autistic advisory group. There are five weekly modules with self-compassion exercises that our participants can practice every day. The program has been designed so that autistic adults can go through it on their own. The content of the program is based on the Mindful Self-Compassion Program, developed by Drs. Kristen Neff and Chris Germer. We will be running a research project to evaluate the effectiveness of this program um, and will soon be recruiting participants. So please let us know if you would like to try this online self-compassion program. Um, feel free to email, email us at this email address, which is uh, research at autismspectrum.org.au. My name is Chris Edwards, and these disclosure projects fall under the acceptance research priority. So an example of disclosure is sharing that I'm autistic. So some people may be accepting and supportive while others may not be um, and can even be discriminated against. Alternatively, there are options where we can disclose but choose not to as an attempt to, to fit into a non-autistic world. But then again, this can come at a cost to our mental health. Uh, so the current research around disclosure and non-disclosure is, is filled with limitations and gaps around such a complex decision. So RCAP's disclosure projects have been split into three phases. Phase one explores the association between an autistic person's intersecting identities and their disclosure decisions. Phase two is using experience sampling methodology to understand the real life disclosure outcomes for autistic adults. And phase three, which is just starting up, is ex uh, examining the disclosure experiences reported by autistic adults in online platforms. So intersecting identities. So we know very little about how identity may influence an autistic person's disclosure decisions. Um, and that's what this research question was trying to explore. 
So we completed an online survey with 124 autistic adults, um, which included some identity scales, so ethnic identity, religious, autistic, sexual, gender identity. Um, and the rates of disclosure were positively associated with autistic identity importance and sexual identity importance. So the higher people valued these identities, the more likely they were to disclose. Um, and there was no association with religious identity importance or ethnic identity importance. Um, so they're still preparing the results and writing this up. Um, phase two is around experience sampling methodology. So as researchers called for a focus on real life outcomes of disclosure. So we use this method to capture an autistic person's thoughts, feelings and behaviours in the moment after an opportunity for disclosure or non-disclosure. And this was through a smartphone application um, using participation in everyday life, so a PL application. Uh, and our participants were 36 autistic adults um, over a two month period. And we received over 200 disclosure entries. So, you know, roughly two thirds disclosure and one third non-disclosure. Uh, and this is just an example of some of the questions that are asked. So these are screenshots from the phone application. Um, for instance, what was the context of this, of this experience where you can just select the option. Um, options for open-ended responses where people could describe the reaction they observed or describe why they thought it was a good decision. Um, and, you know, for example, another a slider rating the positive or negative experience. And the final phase is around online platforms. So it's an extension on phase two, looking at those real life outcomes. Um, so it's in the early stages at the moment, but the aim is to explore what autistic adults are saying online about disclosure experiences. So what's, this, what's the impact on their lives? Is there a trend over time? Um, and so the method's still being determined, but we'll be collecting and analyzing from public, uh, public and free posts. So for example, Twitter, Reddit, Wrong Planet, Facebook. Um, and that's it. So stay tuned for the results as they're all sort of in their early stages or being prepared. Thank you. In 2023, RCAP will be evaluating Aspects Distance Education Program. The program is available to students living in New South Wales. It commenced in 2020 with six students in years three to six, and in 2021 extended to years seven and eight. Currently, we have 38 students across years three to 10. Each class of six students has one teacher. There is an on-site supervisor that must be available each school day for each child in the home. The program is offered via Google Classroom with assistance from other educational apps to support learning. Each child must attend a minimum of 15 days of residential over the school year. The timetable is a mix of a whole class online instruction, online small groups and one-on-one -on -one instruction. Uh, all sessions are recorded and the timetable is flexible to allow for the children's other commitments. In 2020, we conducted a pilot study where we investigated the benefits, challenges and outcomes of the program from the perspective of the parents, students and teachers at that time. Overall, the program was described as a positive experience parents saw benefits and compared it favourably to their child's prior schooling placement. They especially appreciated the flexibility and the individualised nature of the program, where children could work at their own pace, and parents reported that the home environment was more conducive to learning. The level of flexibility and individualisation did present some challenges for teachers, and teachers and parents talked about the level of parental involvement that was required um, to ensure parent students' participation. In terms of the outcomes, many of the parents reported that their student children were more engaged in learning and that they'd made positive gains in their academic progress, although that was mixed depending on the child. There was a perception that the program might be more suited to particular types of students, for example, those that were not contending with any significant language or learning difficulties. Overall, there was reduced anxiety for the students and fewer behaviours of concern. Um, parental outcomes were mixed. Some parents reported much less stress participating in the program, whereas others found it somewhat more stressful. In terms of social interaction, the children all were described as having positive relationships with other students, 
but parents did describe a need for um, more social opportunities for their child. Of course, there were some limitations with this initial study being such a small sample size. There was only one female student and only one child with an intellectual disability. Uh, we did not obtain any measures of outcomes at the time. So for our 2023 evaluation study, we'll be guided by research questions such as what are the social, academic, behavioural and mental health outcomes for students enrolled in their very first year of a distance education program? Are there any child characteristics such as age, autism severity, language level, whether or not a child has a co-occurring mental health condition or an intellectual disability that might be associated with those outcomes? We're all also interested in other parents. So do parents whose children participate in Aspects Distance Education Program report any changes in mental health and wellbeing? We're hopeful that the information that we gather from this follow-up study will help us in continuously improving the program, but also identifying those particular child uh, and family characteristics that might tell us which children are most suitable for participation in a program such as this. Thank you. All right, welcome back, everybody. Perhaps one of the, just a simple question from Pamela was, um, and this, I guess, is the research priorities question. Um, were participants drawn from aspect services and staff or more broadly? They, there was two parts to the research priorities project. The first phase, or, or the study one, were, were, it was nationally drawn from autistic people. Uh, adolescents and parents and carers right across the country. The second phase, which was more internal looking, reflecting those priorities back to ASPECT itself. So in that sense, it was the phase two or study two. The participants were ASPECT's own, autistic um, people, students, uh, families and staff. Yeah. So it was a mixture of the two for the entire project. Fantastic, thank you. I'm loving the daytime TV sofa vibe as well that's happening in the room. I think it's a bit Ella confident. DeGeneres. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I'm um, staring off somewhere else. Yes, we do. There was a, a question from Tony just around, obviously one of the areas around, one of the priority areas was around education. And the question was, um, does this include tertiary education such as university and TAFE and things like that? So I think mainly um, that research area is to do with the uh, kind of K to 12 education. Um, however, um, we talked earlier and um, we're open to research um, about, you know, tertiary education and how to improve that as well. So yeah. definitely our cap's open to that as well. Okay, that's good. And, and uh, you know, it really feels like there's a strong interest in that, particularly in terms of um, how you might sort of use transition to employment and things like that as well. Um, I think there was two bigger questions as, that uh, might take a little bit more to, to answer. There was one from Krishna, just really um, picking up on something that Ainsley mentioned about research to practice and wanting to say, you know, can you talk a little bit more about how uh, a research paper that's produced by RCAP actually finds its way into day-to-day -day practice for ASPECT? Who's going to answer that one? Trevor? <laughs> Yes, and feel free, Ainsley, to jump in as well. Um, I guess when the research at um, RCAT or Aspects Research Program has a difference really to perhaps the research publications coming out of uh, a university institution, um, our team, we are charged with developing a report summaries of every project that actually goes internally. It is for first all the participants in our study who participated. It's to our executive team, the aspect executive. Sometimes, and the research priorities project went to our board of directors. So we have kind of two ways of disseminating the reports. First is internally and in fairly lay speak, lay language summaries. Second, of course, is to um, publish in journals. So there's really the two ways that we get the information out. In our organisation aspect, we've got a direct link from the outcome of our research projects straight into 
integrating those outcomes into the approach that all of our staff and services, whether it's early intervention, schools, adult programs, et cetera, that the outcomes are translated into our approach called the ASPECT, comprehensive approach, training modules are developed, rolled out to all of our staff. So Christian, I think that's you know, an example of how we translate research into practice. And you know, I think RCAP's in a very privileged position being part of such a large service organisation to be able to do that, because it's not necessarily that um, you know, usual for a lot of other um, research institutions. Yeah, fantastic. Thanks, Trevor. It's good to hear that um, the work doesn't start the publication, that it really um, comes through to frontline practitioners. Um, I think, you know, there was no big surprises in the, the eight categories in terms of overall areas. I think most people would agree with those as, as priority areas. It's lovely to hear some of the details. I think one of the questions is they are quite broad in their scope. And a question is, you know, how do you then take the next steps into prioritizing more specific areas of research and how do you stay true to the feedback that you got from autistic participants I'm looking in the, the studio maybe for somebody to answer that <laughs> yeah um, <laughs> I will okay um yeah we it's interesting only it was about three four weeks ago we had our um um uh, a review of our whole research strategy. We're halfway through a research strategy that spreads 2019 to 2025. So we were kind of halfway. So we did a review. And as part of that, we also met and we invited some of our autistic staff from across the organisation, Ainsley, Chris, our autistic researchers. And we looked at developing, you know, the studies. You, know, you had examples of three. And that was based on, you know, what the participants reported under each of those areas. You know, the fuller report has got the finer detail. You know, it's sort of that points us in the direction of what, you know, is needed to be studied. And they are broad, which does mean that it gives opportunity for a program of research, a series to be undertaken under those broad Priorities. I think the key is we now know what are those broad areas that should be researched. And it's not done and dusted, the fact we have consulted, sought the input from autistic people. Every study under the eight will be developed again in partnership either with our autistic researchers, external autistic consultants. So I guess the partnership approach continues right through the future of all of our projects that we develop. Yeah. Fantastic, that's great. I might just try and squeeze two more questions in before we wrap up. The question from Rowena, um, which was just really how will the information from the research be communicated through to schools? Um, I guess obviously, you know, there's aspect schools, but there's other schools more broadly. Um, any thoughts around communication of, of the results of this project? Uh, well, you know, I mentioned we've got different ways internally. Also, in terms of disseminating some of our, our educational projects, the way we would do that is to send also copies of the outcomes of those reports to the different education sectors. I mean, we have no control if they're going to, you know, take those suggestions, recommendations on board. That is something we have done in the past and we need to be mindful going forward that it's not just journal articles, it's not just internal um, reports to aspect, but it's also to whatever sector, wider group is involved under that you know, priority um, project, yes. Thanks, Trevor. And we will, I think, mention an RCAP conference a little later um, in, yes. in the presentation, so that will be another opportunity to hear more. Um, and finally, a uh, question from Vicky. If the distance ed schooling model via Google Classrooms is deemed successful, can you see this becoming accessible to us autistic students Australia-wide? Vic, is that a you? Yeah, look, I'm not in the education space, but I know there is some regulations that 
um, education systems have to abide by across the various states. So, for example, in New South Wales, for us to get that particular program approved, we had to abide by New South Wales education guidelines, which included, for example, that they have to have a um, residential component of a minimum of 15 days. So that's doable for us um, in New South Wales because we can arrange for them to come to our sites, but we don't have sites Australia-wide. So it would probably depend on the rules and regulations of the education systems in other states, where, particularly where we don't operate. Fantastic. Thanks, Vic. That's great. Um, if anybody would like to know more about the Aspect Research Priorities Project, you can now download the full report from the Aspect website. I think you can get there through that QR code or just come to the, uh, to the Aspect website. Just to finish up, um, I just would like all of our um, attendees just to thank our participants for um, their, all of their presentations. I appreciate all of your work, uh, you in the studio, but particularly Chris um, and your work today, just supporting the webinar as well was fantastic. It was lovely to hear from you to um, Rue, uh, Mustafa, um, such interesting stuff. Um, I'm just really pleased that research is finally answering and asking the good questions around, you know, what a good life is and not how do we perhaps make people, you know, a certain way or, or uh, behave a certain way. So um, that's fantastic. So thanks very much, everybody, for attending. We hope to see you again in future RCAP webinars. There certainly will be other webinars, uh, topics to be decided. So thanks so much for coming along. Um, we hope to see you again in the future.